Hi, it's Carolyn. Welcome to a memorable edition of Racehorses Etc. Have you ever wondered what it was like to travel with racehorses on a train from coast to coast? Well, trainer Art Sherman is here to tell us. Born in 1937, Art is the cowboy who made it good. He was launched into racing stratosphere as the trainer of a grand horse and Kentucky Derby winner California Chrome. And it was old school horsemanship that made it possible. This is Racehorses Etc., the podcast celebrating horsemanship. I'm Carolyn Conley. I've covered horse racing on TV for over a decade, exercised some of the best horses in the world, and represented top jockeys. Here, I speak to icons and everyday racing folks to deepen our understanding of horsemanship. Art, thanks so much for joining me today on Racehorses Etc. It's an honor to have you here on the show. Well, thank you. I've had so much fun knowing you throughout all these years in California, and you've been especially good to me with my jockeys. You were very loyal to little Midge, Laura Werner, and to jockey Stuart Elliott. And I just wanted to start by saying thank you for all those winners. Uh, it was my pleasure. You know, it's it's fun when you get to know people and, and remember them for a long time. It's That's what this game is about, loyalty, you know, and, and uh, as I was a rider myself for 23 years. You've also trained a Kentucky Derby winner, Art. Does that ever get old to hear? No, it, it, it's very exciting to know that you're one of the people that have won the Derby. It's a great honor to win that race. You know, it's uh, you'll always be remembered for a guy that won the Kentucky Derby. Because everybody asks you when you meet him for the first time, have you ever won the Kentucky Derby? You know, that, <laughs> that's the opening line, but I'm not... Uh, so now you can say, yeah, I have, by the way. <laughs> right? So it's pretty cool. And you can show them that incredible ring. That's right. I forgot about the ring. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, and you also have a golden whip. You've not only won the Kentucky Derby with California Chrome, he was two-time horse of the year, and you won the Dubai World Cup. And you were chosen to train him because of your old school training style. True. So what does that mean? What were those owners meaning when they said, your old school training style. Maybe because I'm old. That's what <laughs> but I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, I've been around a long time. My era is kind of, you know, I started training in 75, you know, and, and then we go back to where if you wanted to start, you know, when I was a kid, you know, we brought up, and I, that was in the late 50s, you know, I rode my first race. Well, I was actually on, on the racetrack in 53. I rode my first race in 55. So I, I guess you could call me an old timer, you know, but <laughs> training was different in them days. You know, they took more, more time than it is now. You know, I, I, uh, I just can't get used to the new methods of training horses the way they have you now. The veterinarians have to check you, double check you, you know, I, I like the old school better. Well, I do too. And I came up under a lot of old school trainers learning how to groom horses and how to gallop horses up in Washington State. But you go back to Rex Ellsworth and Mesh Tenney. And Neil French, the trainer who's old school, was telling me that Mesh Tenney had kind of a jockey school where you were putting in a lot of work and a lot of labor. Tell me about that start on the racetrack. Well, that's true. You know, when in my era, you had a go under contract, you know, when you're first starting to learn. And a lot of people didn't want to teach you because it's, you know, it takes a lot of time, like I said, at least two years to get your feet wet and, and learn how to gallop a horse. And first of all, when I first started, I went through breeding season and from the bottom up and and uh, bred a lot of horses to different. We had a horse called Call Ed, who was a champion horse in California for about three years. He was leading sire, and uh, he was a great horse. And I used to figure eight him all the time and uh, keep him fit, you know, for the breeding shed. And uh, it was quite an experience for somebody that's never been around horses, you know. So it's uh, – and people don't realize you have to have a lot of patience to teach a young kid. You know, it's uh, – you put in a lot of time, and, and, and it – you know, it, it's rewarding if you can make it. A lot of guys dropped out. They couldn't handle it. 
you know, and uh, it's almost a 24 hour job. You're always on call and, you know, you stay at the barn and, and, you know, in breeding season, you breed it at all times during the night, you know, they come and horses get in heat. And it, it's just, if you can make it for the first year, you're, you're going to be okay. So this was on Rex Ellsworth's place in California? In Ontario, California. That's where I started. Right. And he was a formidable guy. I mean, he had kind of a racing empire going for a while, didn't he? Well, it's true. You know, we we won like at Hollywood Park, we won 23 stakes. We're the all-time leading. I was I was galloping myself four stake winners, you know, and uh, <clears throat> In fact, I got to break California Kids Maiden. He was a full brother correspondent. I'm going back a long way where all the great horses were, you know. And uh, in that era, we had Heather Call, Fleet Call, and Physician. And, all. you know, we had so many different stake winners. It was unbelievable that one barn could do that good, you know. And you had swaps. I've seen pictures of you aboard. Swaps came up when... Uh, and the second year I was with him, you know, and uh, he used to ride contract boys. A, a, a kid called John Burt. Well, he was no kid now, but he was uh, riding for Rex Ellsworth. And, and the horses were running good. He won quite a few, you know, smaller stakes. But then, uh, you know, they were on the Mormon religion. And he was going on a, what do they call it when you go on a, they go for two years and they have to teach the Mormon religion to different people. So he he quit. And uh, just the next year I was coming up. So now Shoemaker got to ride most of the horses. And when he got to ride them, they were like machines, you know, one after another. They kept winning, 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 you know what I mean? So I had my work cut out being a young kid coming up. But it was a great experience. Shoe was great. You know, I used to take him to the post with my pony when he rode all the big races. And, and it, it was quite exciting for me, you know, being a 16, 17, 18-year-old, you know, I've spent that time. So it was a great experience. We went back to Kentucky and won the Derby with swaps. And they thought we were crazy, you know, cowboys. We figured it a mate in between the barns, you know. We used to go, I used to jump on a bareback. Instead of walking them, we kind of f- trotted them, figurated them. And, they thought, who the hell are these cowboys hollering? See, after we galloped them, we walked them and cooled them out for about 45 minutes walking back to the barn. You know, it wasn't like jogging to the barn and jogging back like they do now. We spent a lot of time walking down the paths and standing them and doing this. So they were cooled out by the time we got back to the barn. And then we never walked them. You know, they were already ready to be hosed off, scraped up, and we put them in. It was kind of a little bit on the cowboy side, but... It, we got a lot of results doing that, too. And we only didn't have a lot of grooms. I think one groom took care of 10 head of horses in them days. So uh, I used to feed early in the morning. I 4.30, I was feeding the horses and helping grooms, you know, at that time. But under contract, that's what I'm saying, that this, you had to spend all this time. But I went to the Superior Court in L.A. Me and uh, Larry Gilligan went together. We got our license together. So that's how long I know Larry Gilligan, you know. We've always been good friends. He's so much fun. Yeah, I know. It was quite a different era, like I said. Nobody does that anymore, contracts and this and that. Now now they want to sue you if you want to do something wrong, you know. But in them days, you never thought about that. Well, and there were some repercussions if you didn't work a horse just right, from what you told me. Something about a cold water hose? Oh, yeah. We, when you screwed around and didn't get the time right, or you wasn't, you know, kids get the plane. When you got back, you got the cold water hose down your pant leg. And at Santa Anita, when it's about 42 in the morning, try that on and gallop horses after that. You get your attention after that, you know. So it's, uh, and then don't forget, you know, we, we go back where there was no airplanes. We went by train. I, we went back to Chicago with a bunch of horses and I was on the train for a long time and I had to take care of four horses by myself. When we brought back swaps for the, uh, to go stream, you know, we were like five to seven days in the train, which in them days, you know, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. I ran out of food about the second day and I, every time the train stopped, I had to run out and try and get a hot dog or a hamburger 
run back and it was quite an experience you know you look back now and you say wow this business has changed now you get on a jet and you're there in two hours you know yeah the horses so it's it's different you know, I've seen the photographs of the train coming into the train station by Santa Anita Park, and I would always sit, just close my eyes and imagine the sound of those horses walking on that platform, that wood platform, you know, the clip-clop as they unloaded off the train, and it must have been such a cool scene. You know, when we unloaded the horses, I was on one bareback leading the other one by hand, you know. So I was on one thoroughbred leading another thoroughbred down the road when we got there. Because our horses were broke. One thing about them, you know, we had a lot of nice horses and good attitudes. And, you know, we were just uh, cowboys that made it good. You know, they had a lot of good horses. So did you, where did you sleep on the train? Right between, I had a sleeping bag and I was right between, I had two on one side and two on the other side. and. All during the night, they used to dip in the water bucket and bam, put it on top of me, and I get soaking wet in the morning. And my hair, would, believe me, I was right by the time I got to Chicago. I was five days of doing that, you, you might, have, you needed a good shower. I can tell you that. I can't imagine. No, it was fun. It was fun. When you're that age, you can do it. You know what I mean? Now, if you said, "Art, right, you're going to spend." Five days on the horse train, I might have not made it. <laughs> I couldn't get up. I don't. Uh, but, you know, their experiences and, you know, the life stories, you know, there's a lot of them. When you were flying business class to Dubai for California Chrome to run in the Dubai World Cup, would you ever reflect back on riding on the train with the horses and how things had changed? We went first class on, on Emirates. Man, did they fed you? Right. They ruined me. I can't fly any other airplane with that. From now on. <laughs> me and my, my wife, we had a private little bird, and they went into a bed, and they pamper you. and Had a shower on air. I've never seen that before. You can go in there and take a shower and bathrobe and slippers and give you uh, – it, it was an unbelievable experience, you know, to fly – like that, you know. like I said, it ruined me. You know, yes. I can't, I can't fly anymore. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about, Art. Hey, so when you took shoe to the post, when you were a kid on the pony taking Shoemaker to the starting gate to ride all these great horses for Mesh Tenny, um, what stuck with you? What did you learn from Shoe during those moments? Well, Shoemaker was in a class of his own. You know, his his. Uh, Greatness became his hands because he only weighed like uh, under 100 pounds. You know, he's only 97 pounds. He wore like a size four shoe. You know, he was very small and uh, and uh, he never bothered a horse. You know, you could get the great riders like Art Carroll and Steve Brooks who were tough and strong on a horse. He would just take that long hold, sit back there and let the horse do the running, you know, and you never get him in trouble. He had to go a little bit wide. You know, you learn a lot from being around a guy like him. And when you're riding against him later on when I was an apprentice and had it, and he used to come by and say, where do you think you're going with the horse's mouth wide open and you're sitting there, you think you got a chance, and all of a sudden there's this big horse running off with him and he's laughing at you when he comes by. You know? So it was, it was quite a quite a fun time for me, you know. And, you know, Art, you rode at tracks all across the country, and many of those little tracks don't even exist anymore. What were some of your favorites? Well, you know, we we were running uh, Boston at Suffolk Downs, which is not there anymore. Rockingham, I rode there, and that's not there anymore. And uh, We, uh, you know, I came, I rode New York and Jersey, Chicago, we spent a a whole year in Chicago. So uh, it was quite an experience riding all over the country, you know, in them days, you know, you could move around and, 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 and do it a little easier. And now, now the racing has got to be where, you know, so much money and the purses are so big that uh, it's uh, everybody, you know, you can enter horses all over and there's six different tracks within a hundred miles, you know, so they're, 
they're all in demand for the horses to be there. And, and it's, it's a lot different. We didn't have all the racetracks running at the same time like you do now. In terms of horsemanship, would you say that you developed most of your horsemanship from Mesh Tenney? Who were your major influences? Well, I wouldn't say that. I used to ride for a guy called Paul Gadotti, who was a small trainer. He had like four horses, and I used to be his number one rider. And he used to make me get up at 4.15 and work the horses in the dark so they couldn't get the clock or couldn't see him. They like to bet a few dollars once in a while, you know. So that's my schooling. You know, I I got to watch him, and, and he was a great a great inspiration for me, you know, and uh, really a super nice guy. He loved my family. I loved my kids. And uh, we had a great time together. And I miss him a lot. I think about him now. You know, and I said he would have been proud of me knowing that we won the Derby and everything. I look back and all, all my friends, Richard Matlow, who I used to ride for, was one of my great friends. And he was there when Alan was born, my my youngest son, we were at the hospital together. You know, you look back and think of the compliments, compliments, you know, that you uh, made yourself and and wish you had your friends to be with you when, when that happened, you know, to win the richest race in the world. And, and, you know, going all over with a horse like California Chrome, a dream come true, you know. You wonder why it happens to you once in a while. You know, you can train a lot of horses. I had one great at stakes before that. You know, we had a couple of good horses. Siren Lore, I claimed it for 50000 To go to the Derby and even to run a horse in the Derby, I never thought I would ever do that. You know what I mean? I didn't think I'd ever have the caliber of horse to do that. You know what I mean? I, I was always, you always wish that you could, you know what I mean? And, and it was uh, kind of a storybook story, this whole thing with California Chrome. And that's why it made such a good book. And and it's going to be fun. You know, they could have made a movie out of this, really, if they wanted a good horse picture. I think just the people that were involved, you know, and naming the horse and just, you know, this is what keeps people, you know, when I went and won the Preakness, the lady that the head of the, uh, Maryland Thoroughbred Association told me, she says, you don't know what you've done for this game. She says to me, she says, you know, it keeps people in the business knowing that a horse that they bought for nothing turned out to win $15 million. You know what I mean? You don't have to be a millionaire and billionaire to buy your way in these races. Yeah. You know? Now you look, I'm in a maiden race, one, a million three, 800,000. You know, every time you run a horse, you, you look at the program and see what they give for them horses. And here you get a $1,500 stud out of a $800 mare. So, you're, you you know, it can happen. You know, it, it's just that's what keeps you in the game. You know, it's uh, and you got to be lucky. You know, it's, uh, it's a game of luck. And I was just very fortunate that it happened to me, you know, and, I'm just now looking at my horse right now within the Pacific Classic, which was one of my favorite races. I got a big picture sitting on the wall here, and he's smiling at me as he went by. So <laughs> I love the game, and it's been good to me. And Sometimes you wonder what you're going to do when it comes time to retire, you know, but you just do it, you know. It's, but it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, you just don't retire. <laughs> How about that? We just want you to be around at the barn and laughing. And <laughs> she wants me to do other things with her. You know, we're getting up in the age and, and we like to travel and do things. Yeah. Right? And I'll always be involved. You know, both my sons are trainers and I own horses, part of them, well, quite a few. So it won't be that hard for me, I don't think. But I'm, you know, when you've done something all these years, you know been on the racetrack over 60 years you know so it's kind of hard you know what did it mean to put Faye in the Kentucky Derby winner circle with you and to take her to Dubai I mean it's pretty incredible yeah she had a ball Faye's a a trooper we had more fun you know just doing that you know it's once in a lifetime like I told her I says you know you got to be so 
so thankful that that happened to us. You know, it's an experience we never went through. You know, when in the Derby, I see where we were, were, the pictures coming where we were hugging each other, you know. There's so many stories. I hate to get off what we're talking about, you know. No, I want to hear your favorite story. So if you've got one, bring it on. All right. When I was with Rex Ellsworth, you know, we went to Florida. And, and of course, Shoemaker was riding swaps in. But we had another horse called California Kid. He was a full brother to correspondent. And I raised him. His mother died giving birth to him. And uh, I got to ride him in the race. And I was living in the tack room at Gulfstream Park. And I saved up about, oh, I would say $100. I had a bankroll. I wasn't making much money. So I had a, you know. Save all I could. So I'm riding the horse. Shoemaker left and went on a party yacht somewhere, and I got to ride the horse. He's going three eighths of a mile in it, and it's straight away. So I uh, I bet what I had, I bet uh, forty to win, forty to place, and I remember thirty to show or something like that. On, and I said I got it because I love the horse, and he had some ability, you know. So sure enough, we wind up winning that that race. Uh, and that always reminded me, I thought I was the richest kid in the world after that. I got like almost 1400 back because the horse paid pretty good, 20-something. And I remember that uh, they used to have a tax shop at, uh, at Gulfstream where we were. And uh, I bought me some a suit and alligator shoes. Man, I would dress to the T after that. You know what I mean? I Never could afford that. All I had was the Levi's and the pair of boots. So. And all the jocks were fancy. You know, everybody dressed up in that era. You know, you look pretty good. Silk suits, this, that, you know. So I was kind of in my glory when that happened, you know. Oh, that's awesome. And his name was California Kid, and then you end up with California Chrome. It's pretty wild. Yeah, he became a good horse. You know, Hartack rode him and won the Washington Arlington Fraternity back in Chicago in that year. I went on, they leased my contract. I went on and worked for Tommy Hurd and went back east and uh, rode through the Middle West, uh, Thistle Downs, Randall, and all that time. I spent back east about nine years. So uh, it was it was quite an experience. And I know cashing a bet in those days was a big deal. Well, you know, you had to survive and, and, and it was a different. You know what I mean? You, you like to bet on a horse or two that you think, think that could win and uh a lot of things you know in that era went on you know what i mean it's uh it was a little looser i would call it you know <laughs> yes I, I think uh getting them ready to win on the right day there's a lot of there's a lot of things go into it you know and uh you got to know what you're doing you know but uh i liked your writer he's old old school your writer was my era type of jock. Stuart Elliott. Elliott. We came up about the same time. You know, he was, of course, a lot younger than I was, but he knew all about race riding. He was a good rider. And he's still a good rider. I watched him win a race the other day in, in uh, Texas the other day. I said, well, he's still going. You know, he still looked good on a horse, too. Remarkable. How old is Stuart? Well, he's 55. Hey, he still looks good. Yeah, he's... Awesome. I'm still his biggest fan. No, I put him on one. I I get tired of these guys, you know, they always turning you around, but he was pretty cool. I uh, I liked him a lot. What are those qualities in a rider that you see in a guy like him that remind you of riders of the past? Well, I think it's dedication and knowing where you're at. Smart, knows how to ride a good race. You hardly ever see him get Shut off. I can watch a race now and know they're going to get in trouble by the time they hit the three April. I said, what are you doing? The horse is going to stop. Ease out now. You know, I watch these races after riding. I watch my sons run at Golden Gate. I get sick to my stomach sometimes watching because I can see it's going to happen. And uh, being a former rider, you get that depth of where you should be and not how the horse is running. And he never hardly ever got a horse in trouble. No. And see, you could watch the other riders and you know, some of them don't have control like they should, you know, so it makes you ride a different race. He's so fun to watch. Some people would say Stu was a speed rider. I always said he's a position rider. He would get himself in a position to win. And it was typically 
near the front. He liked to be, you know, tactical. In contention. Yeah. But then I represented Brees Blanc, who's known for his turf riding, and he would come from off the pace. And that guy could be down on the rail at the back of the pack and work his way through the entire field and never lose momentum. It would just blow my mind. He would not get stopped. He would just find his way right through. I know a lot of the European riders have that. You know, they ride lap and tap and you don't, you watch them European riders and, you know, to Tori, I liked him a lot. I got to meet him when I was back in uh, in England and, and Dubai. We got to be pretty good friends. You know, he took me all over and introduced me. We were doing a lot of television and different things. And he was a commentator with one of the English channels. So it was it was quite an experience being around that kind of people and great writers. You know, I, I'll, I'll always remember that. I got a chance to go to New Market and, and stay there and, and watch how they train up and down the hills. And it was a, quite a different experience for me, you know. I didn't train the horse. I had uh, another, yeah, but I got a chance to see the facility, you know. Because, you know, you got to know when you go to Europe, they, they, their style is a lot different. You know, they go up hills, down hills, and and different tracks, fast tracks, uh, wood chip tracks. They got like four or five different tracks. And so we gave our horse, uh, California Chrome, to another. I, I've done that myself. I bailed out of it because I said, I don't know how to train a horse in Europe. You know, you need people that are around that area. So, But I got a chance to watch them and, and observe everything. And quite an experience. I, a lot of good trainers are back there. You know, but it's a different style. The kid that rub, you know, the they rub them and gallop them and take care of it. It's a, it's a different like we do in the United States quite a bit. Little Midge is back in England and she's having fun back there. So you gave her a good start here in California. Yeah, she was a cute little gal. Yeah, Tough. but it, it's you know, females. It's always hard to get them started. You know, it's uh, it's kind of rough era you know you got well we won for you yeah i know i know we went a race we won for bob baffert right right you had your work cut out i know it's it's not easy trying to push a young rider and even female you know that some people that still well, i'm never ride a female rider you know <laughs> and she won for godolphin that's true but yeah you're right it was no it was not easy Yeah. So if you could bring back some of the qualities of old fashioned horsemanship to now, maybe some of the things that you most appreciated about how things used to be done, what would it be? Keep them veterinarians away from my barn that much. We know we didn't use that many veterinarians, you know, now these days, like if you're going to work a horse, you have to have, I mean, really, you have to have a veterinarian look at him before you're going to work your horse. I mean, that's trainers. I mean, you think I'm going to work a horse that's not sound? You know, that's, that's, you're not a trainer if you do that. You know, it's like taking your dignity away from you and you can't do what you really want to do. And it's just like today they, they're calling me over a horse that, He's running back in nine days because the owner wanted to run him at Santa Anita. And I said, okay, there was a race. He came out of the race good. He finished third last time at Los Alamitas. But he has a little issue with his shin. He's been shin bucked. And we gave him like four months, put a good blister on him. But when they go over him and they squeeze them shins, a lot of horses, just a sensitivity of, of putting your fingers right into their shins, they have a reaction of, pulling away, you know, it's uh, just common sense, you know, but uh, it's just things like that that kind of infuriate me, you know, it makes you think, well, you don't know what you're doing and we're going to do what we have to do to keep these, it's not true, we all know what we're going to do and I would never put a jock on a road for, like I said, 23 years, do you think I'd put a jock on a horse that I knew was going to be bad, you know, I I would be my worst nightmare is to have somebody get hurt, you know. So I'd be the last person, but I understand it's a floor mat they do now, and I just go along with it. If you're going to train horses, that's what you got to do. 
Uh oh, I got I got to get my vets on the phone. Hold on. Yes, yeah, sir. All right, super. Thank you. Okay. See you later. Bye bye. Okay, we got the green light to go. I I told him I <clears throat> the horse is fine. Was that the X-ray of the shin? The results? And they said it was clean. But like I said, you know, the horse had shin buck and that leg that they grabbed, you know. And he's going to flinch if you grab it, you know. It's, uh, it's, the horse is sensitive, you know. Has common sense been lost? Oh, yeah, it, it's a different ball game. I'm not knocking the way that they do things, but it's not fun anymore. You know, they took all that feeling and and being able to develop everything. You know, like if you have a horse that hadn't run in a year, you got to take blood and you got to do that. I mean, you're working the horse and you know if he's sound or not, this and that, but you can't run them until they have a special state vet go over and take the blood so they know that you're not cheap. I don't know what they're doing. Why would you want to take blood on a horse that's been off for a year and you gave him the time because you're doing the right thing? You know, you're giving a horse time off, but now you have to go through all its formality, you know. That's what I'm saying. It took the old school out of it. You know what I mean? It's uh, taking your trainer's ability to train a horse. That's what's inspired me, I think, to do this podcast, is that this podcast is specifically about horsemanship, because I feel like it's suddenly in peril, that it could be a lost art, because we're we're making everything a, about the numbers and the data and the the science, but not about the feel and the art of training a horse. True, true. It It takes all the fun out of it, because... You know, even when you're raising horses and getting them ready, it's an art of getting a two-year-old ready. And, and you know, the, I could understand that Santa Anita had a lot of breakdowns, and I don't know why, you know. To me, we've had so many more breakdowns now than we did 40 or 50 years ago. But I think it's the breeding that's in that. I think there's too much inbreeding, and, and a lot of structure of the horse's bones aren't there. That's my theory. You know, because I rode so many horses that were old and beat up and had big knees and big ankles. They wouldn't even let them run now, the horses that I rode. They would never let them run because they said, well, he has a big ankle. We can't run him. But the horse was natural, had calcification. Were those horses built differently? Were they sturdier, bigger? The cannon bones were different and everything. And I, now they're, they're more... The bones aren't there. I've seen x-rays on a lot of different horses, and, and the structure isn't like it used to be. I don't think it's a medication issue myself, totally. I think the racetracks sometimes, they get paranoid. And uh, I think it's the way you train a horse, and if the track is bad. See, now when it rains, they don't even want you to run. And I rode in tracks that were so deep that, you could fall down walking through it. You know what I mean? And yeah. now there was the whole game is different. You know, it's uh, everybody's kind of, I don't know, paranoid to me. Like, it's, I can't even believe that some in San Anita, when it rains, they won't even race, want to race. You know what I mean? And I can remember when I was a kid, we rained for 30 straight days in San Anita and we ran. You know what I mean? Years ago. You know, I I just don't know. Yeah, I don't like it. I love handicapping for the mud. I love the old mudders. I liked a rainy day at the track. True. And and it, I'll tell you, some horses used to just stand out when the track got soft and muddy. Man, you could bet your money. You're hoping that it would be a muddy track. But they know that it, they moved up five or six lengths in an off track. But you see, you don't get that anymore. There's a lot of things that you could, I could sit down and tell you the pros and cons. It would take probably a, another show, to tell you the truth. Legacy is a big deal. And you have two great sons and Alan and Steve that are both trainers. What does it mean to pass down what you know to them and to watch them flourish? Well, it's the biggest, it's the biggest enjoyment for me to watch my son win a race up there. And, and like he's got, I sent him two that I own part of and they've run really well. And, uh, it makes me feel good, you know, knowing that you're 
family, it's like a legacy. You know, you can always say, hey, I took them with me when we won the Derby and, and the Dubai World Cup. It, it was quite a thing, you know, and I just wanted to let them know that I appreciate them very much. And Alan, he's been your right hand for many years. Oh, Alan, I miss him so much now. It's unbelievable. You know, I, he was my crutch, like, you know, you have your kids with you and work for you. It's different. You can depend on them a little bit more. And their luck always got your back, I call it, you know. Yeah. He's in Kentucky now. I hope he can get started. You know, it's a new, he loves being back there in that area where all the horses are raised. And he loves Kentucky a lot. So I'm hoping he can get started. Uh, Steve's pretty well established. You know, he's got 35 head of horses up there in Golden Gate. So, but it's fun. The legacy is there. Good. Well, thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. All right. I hope somebody likes it. Are you kidding? They're going to love you. Bye-bye. Bye, Art. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Racehorses Etc. Please go to carolynconley.com and become a Racehorses Insider. We'll keep you up to date with exclusive content and more. That's it for now. Remember, until we meet again, enjoy the horses.